Hello, everyone, and welcome to Revisiting Octavia Butler's Parable of the Sower in 2024. This webinar is sponsored by the Harvard Radcliffe Institution as part of its initiative on climate change, with a particular focus on issues of climate justice, and co-sponsored by the Monroe C. Gutman Library at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. My name is Corey Beiser. I'm a senior at Harvard College studying English and environmental science and public policy and I grew up in the Bay Area of California. Last fall, I had the great fortune of taking Professor Dimmick's climate change literature class. While most of the texts we read in that class were written in the past 10 years, there was one great exception. Octavia Butler's iconic Parable of the Sower, published in 1993, but set in 2024, this very same year. Butler's novel follows protagonist Lauren Olamina, a Black young woman living in Southern California trying to survive in a world wrecked by climate change. Notably, Lauren lives with a condition called hyperempathy, which forces her to share the feelings of others. In a world rife with massive wealth inequality, water shortages, refugee crises, drug epidemics, and death, this condition is a great vulnerability. Lauren is also the daughter of preacher and college professor. And this influence, coupled with her keen observations, leads her to create her own religion that guides her throughout her journey. She names this religion Earthseed, and its main tenet is that God is change, a phrase repeated over and over throughout the book. Sure enough, drastic change is a staple throughout the novel. Lauren's family suddenly dies, her community is raided and destroyed, and she is forced to migrate north with two neighbors in the hopes of a better life. Shattering change was similarly present in the early 1990s when Butler wrote Parable of the Sower. The recession of the 1990s struck and took a particularly hard hit on Black communities. Increased globalization led to the formation of mega corporations. The war on drugs created disproportionate incarceration of Black people. And scientists were warning the public about global warming and ecological degradation. These conditions are all present within the novel, and in order to live with longevity, Lauren must have faith in adaptability, resilience, and coalition building with diverse communities. As a young person navigating the inheritance and responsibility of the climate crisis, Lauren and her earth seed religion have become a North Star for me. I remember reading this book for the first time in high school with an abundant yet scattered feeling of wanting to do something but not sure where that something could be. Pair of the Sower taught me two things. One, if I'm going to do anything impactful, I need to work together with people. And secondly, I need to embrace change. Rereading it this year for our class, I was able to see how this book took my scattered energy and pointed it somewhere. I brought it up with my, my friend Amy while we were discussing the details of our future permaculture farm located somewhere in the Pacific Northwest. I said, have you read the book before? She said, of course I've read Parable of the Sower. How else could I be here? Clearly and rightfully, Octavia Butler has greatly inspired generations of people. Her genius changed the game and Parable of the Sower is now perhaps the most iconic and canonical climate fiction novel of all time. Rereading the book now in the year it was set makes the reality we live in all the more clear, and the urge to do better now, all the more pressing. Well, it was my honor to introduce the book, and an even greater honor to listen to the upcoming discussion with Professor Ayanna Jameson and Professor Shelley Streeby. Professor Ayanna Jameson is an educator, professor, mythologist, and depth psychologist. She is the founder of the Octavia E. Butler Legacy Network a global community committed to highlighting Octavia Butler's life and work while creating new works inspired by Butler's legacy. Professor Shelley Streeby is an author and professor of literature and ethnic studies at University of California, San Diego. Before I turn it over to them, we wish to encourage those watching on Zoom to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions at any time during the program, and the speakers will address as many as they can. Since we anticipate a lot of questions, we ask that you keep them short. This will enable them to address as many as possible in the time we have. Furthermore, we want to remind everyone that this is a two-part series, and the second webinar takes place on Tuesday, February 20th 
at 4 p.m. featuring award-winning YA author Nnedi Okorafor. We hope you will join us then. That being said, it is now my pleasure to turn the virtual floor over to Professor Dimmick. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corey. Ayana and Shelley, I want to echo Corey's admiration for your research, your scholarship, your organizing, your activism, for everything you do to keep Octavia Butler's work alive for us today. I'm so grateful we have the time this afternoon to talk about Parable of the Sower together. As readers and fans of this novel know, Parable of the Sower is structured as a series of dated journal entries written by a young protagonist, Lauren Olamina. It opens with Lauren's first journal entry, which was written in 2024, when she is 15 years old, and the novel continues until um, the final journal entry, um, which is written as Lauren is 18. So the heroine of this iconic story is a teenager, right on the cusp of adulthood. And I think of Lauren when I see young adults today mobilizing around issues including climate change, racial injustice, and educational access. Parable of the Sower appeals to readers of all ages. I first read it when I was an adult, but I think of it as YA literature or young adult literature um, insofar as it is a novel deeply invested in exploring the capacities of young people to shape change. So my first um, question for both of you today is, since we are now living in 2024, the year that this novel begins, I'm curious if Parable of the Sower is on your mind um, even more than it usually is. And I'm curious if the book resonates differently for you as our calendars finally catch up to the timeline of Butler's imagination. Ayana, I'd love to turn to you first and get your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. This is a very exciting um, and dynamic time in the universe. Um, and I have to say, um, I have to go back to um, Corey's introduction because I want to say that when I first read Parable of the Sower, I was a substitute teacher in a middle school and I was a broke grad student. So I had to check the book out from the library where I had been an undergraduate. And someone who was a um, who was uh, a major in this um, sustainability, uh, we have like the Lyle Center for Regenerative Studies. Someone had checked out the book, left an envelope in it, right? And the book was so tattered, right? Like so many people had checked it out and it was an essential part of their reading. So I just want to affirm Corey and other students' experiences about how this book impacts them. And I started to write about the archetype of change. And I think for me, the difference between reading it as a 20 something year old, right? And reading it now is that um, I was teaching middle school students and I currently parent a middle school student who's the same age as Lauren Olamina. And when I look at young folks like my nieces and nephews that are you know, a little older than my undergraduate students, that impact the reality of the book Having lived through COVID where we had schools, school in our living rooms, uh, we had remote education like Lauren's parents were embarked upon. Um, there are many, you know, we had shortages of, you know, common medications like recalls on, you know, children's Tylenol and the resurgence of smallpox. So the things that we think of as being prescient in the novel, like the big ticket items, those things, yes, those things occur to me. But for me during the pandemic, when people first began to tell me like, well, what do you think? And she predicted this, the situation is different because there are folks who we're explaining things to that have as much you know, intellect and agency as Lauren Olamina. And it, it really um, sort, of, sort of taps into my belief system that middle school and that age and the age that she is, those are the times when we begin to express our personalities in ways that are really dynamic. 
So that the difference for me, it's just the scope and perspective and what we can do to uplift the generation that's coming and what we can learn from them. That's what Lauren um, Oya, whose middle name means change, right? The deity of change in Yoruba um, cosmology. That's so important to note that, you know, my name is Ayana because of parents like Olamina's parents, right? I have a West African name. So there's something to be said for being this, the first generation who can, what can we do as women? Open a checking account without permission. We, you know, there are many, many things in this timeline that we need to be grateful for. So we have to write ourselves in like Lauren. It's actually an autobiography that Butler says that she's writing. So what journals are we keeping? How do we document ourselves? How do we document ourselves outside of social media and corporately owned uh, platforms? Um, so those are the questions that I have that I sort of pass on to everyone else. That was a long answer, but I think it's a lot. That's a beautiful answer. I, yeah, I like thinking about your daughter and other people who are this age, Lauren's age, right around now. It's like we've reached our Lauren generation. Yeah, I have. Yeah, I yeah, I call it um, raising Olamina, and I've written about this, but I actually have. Um, folks who are identified as boys at this point. So it's a bit a bit different. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know if it's different, but I, I don't want them to one day look at this and feel that I've misgendered them. That's important. Yes. Good clarification. Shelly, I'm curious about you. What it is what is it like for you to read this book in 2024? Well, uh, I also want to say thanks for having us. And, you know, Ayana uh, has a very profound kind of response to that. And I uh, think a lot of what she's saying is really important. My own experience was really different. I first taught the novel in 1993, the year it came out. It was the first book I ever uh, chose for the first class I ever organized on my own. I wasn't a teaching assistant. And it was in the aftermath of the Los Angeles uprisings after the Rodney King decision. And I had been in LA doing research and seeing the kind of scorched landscape. And she was just speaking to that so powerfully in the novel. So at that time, that you know was very meaningful to me. Now I'm 60 years old. I'm teaching it to people you know who are uh, younger than me when I first read it. But I'm teaching it now in a large ethnic studies class uh, on the environment, and it's been really successful in my teaching. Partly because it's a coming of age story. So I know we talk about different categories, and you know there are different ones that we might use. Uh, you know, young adult wasn't one I think she was thinking of. It only kind of came into usage more commonly, you know, I think after she was writing the novel. But she did very much think of it as a coming of age story. And she thought nothing was clearer or more universal than a coming of age story, because anyone who makes it past adolescence has endured it, right? So she felt that it was something that would find a lot of power uh, in readers. And I believe, you know, that's definitely true. So many things about it speak to our present, you know, extrapolation is one of the exercises we do in class. Um, extrapolation is a science fiction term, also a mathematical one. Uh, Octavia would indicate it with the phrase, if this goes on, if, if things keep going like they're going, what may happen? And so, you know, it's very surprising, but it was so grounded in research that this novel, though written in 1992, really just speaks to our moment in so many ways with fire danger, the mega storms, you know, the rollback of environmental regulations and privatization was one thing she was very worried about, which, you know, we also have seen the effects of that in the 30 years that have followed. Um, you know, the rise of the religious right in politics and then of strange demagogues, you know, uh, of course, in the parable novels, she also has a figure very much like Trump, which many people have commented on on social media. Um, I think also the walled uh, gated community is something to my Southern California students that's powerful. That was really just becoming a dominant kind of form when uh, you know she was writing this. But since then, of course, it's become a part of the landscape in a lot of places. And I think it's important when I'm teaching the novel, I really emphasize that she has a part of the novel where she says it's a cul-de-sac, the walled community. It's a dead end because sometimes students want to think the place of safety is the walled community. That's where you should stay. But I think she was very ahead of her time and seeing the problems with gates and walls and how they just wall out people and don't create real solutions. Um, you know, she also has things like the go bag, like what are you going to have that you're going to take with you? 
if you need to run because of climate disaster, that speaks to them powerfully. We all do little exercises where we talk about what we would do and what we would put in it. And at first, everyone wants to put their cell phone in it. So that's one part that sometimes students struggle with. Why didn't you foresee you know, cell phones? But it's very much a kind of low tech feature that you know I think is actually interestingly difficult and are different from a lot of visions of the future that are more high tech. So you know, there's a bunch of ways that I think this is powerful today and teaching it in 20 24 even more so. Yes, I think it's often when I teach it, students experience it as a book that feels prescient in so many ways. When I taught Parable of the Sower in 2020, um, it was right during the huge California wildfires. And because of COVID, as Ayana mentioned, so many of my students were um, were joining class from all over. And so some of them were located in California. And one student wrote and said that they would be missing class because they were um, they had to drive north to escape a wildfire that was coming. And they said that as they were reading Parable of the Sower, driving north from these wildfires, they were passing road signs that were the exact communities that Lauren was passing in the story. So there is this sense of living with this story, I think, for so many of our readers. I wanted to ask you both as um, experts in Octavia Butler's papers about your work in the archives. I know that both of you have spent time in the Huntington Library in San Marino, California, um, really immersing yourself in Octavia Butler's papers and writings. And when I think about this, I think about research as another way of extending life into the future. It's a way of making sure that things endure. And I'm curious to hear about both of your experiences there. Um, Shelley, I know that in your book, Imagining the Future of Climate Change, you describe how Butler compiled research on global warming and how she clipped um, news articles and drew connections between environmental and social collapse. And I'm curious if you can talk about what really struck you as a researcher working with Octavia Butler's papers. Of course. I mean, one of the best things that happened was that I met uh, Ayanna Jameson when I came to the archive because she's been there doing more work, knows the archive, the paper is better than anyone else. And so, you know, I'm glad you're getting to hear from her today because she is the expert. Um, I was fortunate, you know, I live not far away, so I'm able to visit every so often. And then I've held a couple of short-term fellowships over the years. So I was able to dig in, but, you know, of course it's a huge set of papers. So that strikes you right away. Uh, there's so much in it that it's hard to even, you know, summarize it quickly. But in terms of climate change, you know, I, that was the first thing when I started to go through it more systematically, there was just a vast amount of, of material about climate change, which I really wasn't expecting. So one thing she did was she um, clipped from newspapers and magazines, and especially the Los Angeles Times, and she had different subject headings. Um, for instance, there are a lot of files on women or, you know, um, uh, various topics that interested her. She was just an incredible encyclopedic kind of clipper, but she was clipping all kinds of things about climate change, mega storms, you know, environmental rollbacks. It was just everywhere. And she was writing back to it, to the accounts she was getting, which is one thing I love. Um, you know, I think it's really important to think about kind of practices of Black annotation. A lot of kind of Black feminist work really emphasizes how often, you know, you'll see Black women um, using forms like that, writing like back, disagreeing with what the writer is saying or bringing up other kinds of considerations that the writer didn't think about. So she had hundreds of clippings about climate change and environmental problems. And again, very engaged because she's writing back. And then I found many other kinds of materials too that were, you know, clearly climate change is very important. So one of the most interesting things to look at, she wrote in notebooks, these Mead notebooks often, and she would fill them up and there would be maybe part of a draft of something that she was working on, but also just what she was thinking. She would journal in it. And so the frequency with which she writes about climate change and environmental problems in those journals is, is just really striking. 
and something else that I felt I had to spend a lot of time with. And then another thing that I found was that in earlier drafts of Parable of the Sower, she actually talked about climate change much more explicitly. Uh, there's, there's a lot of material that you can just see the research kind of directly making it into the early drafts. But then uh, I guess it was July 31st, 1992. I kind of can remember this date. She wrote in her journal that she was taking out the climate change essays, she called them, and wanted to show instead of tell. Uh, she says, if I leave out the essays about the climate and economy changes, uh, they're boring right now the way they are. It's better to show as opposed to telling. So she really changed the way she did it. But I think it's very rich the way it kind of wells up from everyday life in the novel. But that's a very powerful thing, actually, about it. And I'm sure that there's more uh, that I could think of. I could go on and on. I guess the last thing I would say is one thing I really am interested in in all of her papers is when you have multiple drafts and things she ended up not wanting to publish or didn't want out there. I'm interested in that as a kind of dream work that shows you pathways she refused to take or considered and didn't take. So there's just so much there. And you also, I think, one, if one spends a lot of time in the archive and all the people working on the archive and all the community projects going on with the archive, I don't know, you, there's a kind of intimacy you feel with her where you kind of want to protect her in certain ways too. And then we have to talk about what we want to write about, what we don't want to write about, Ayana, I guess, when we uh, read that stuff. But anyway, that's my answer. But I'm really wanting to know what Ayana will say about that. Yeah. Anna, I want to hear, yes, I want to hear from you about your time in the archive. And I believe you're working on a biography of Butler. Is that I am one of those people who doesn't like to jinx things, but I do know a lot about her life and work because I grew up in Pasadena um, and I live um, about 15 to 20 minutes away um, and spent lots of time um, there. And I just want to say to give people a scope of what it's like to collect hard copies of things over the course of a lifetime and some things from her parents and grandparents time right at the turn of the century. Right. So there are over 10,000 individually cataloged items. Some of those items are hundreds of pages. Um, not all of them are categorized by, um, by subject. So you really don't know what's there until you go there and sit down. Um, and then the other piece of the vast thing, there are over like 350 boxes, right? So they're, you know, and ephemera that also like, so there are things that you would think are not worth collecting that are also meaningful, right? Like I might find a receipt or a grocery list, or I might find a drawing that she did, or she also kept a photocopies or carbon copies of all the correspondence and letters. And like, let's say she sent out Christmas cards that all had a snowman on it. She would say like, I sent these 15 people the snowman card. You know, so there are so many, you know, her stream of consciousness, her handwriting, her, you know, visual motor processing things, um, her self-diagnosis of dyslexia, because of course we didn't have the assessment that we had now. Um, the times when she says one thing in an interview, but I know it to be untrue. And I wonder like, why is she deflecting or calling this a particular thing? Um, but as, um, as your students were saying, I can see the mountains where she was writing about, and I've driven all the way to the top of the state. So it's a California novel. She has another California novel in the archives that was not published, but it's, you know, it's just beautifully rendered. California itself is a character as well as climate change. And that showing versus telling, there's a rainstorm that takes place for many, many, many days and everything gets washed out. That's our current weathered pattern. Last year, it rained and snowed so much the temperatures were freezing in this area close to where Octavia also grew up and was born is like my everyday cultural surround. So that gives me a very unique perspective while I'm writing the things that I'm writing. But thank you so much for asking. I love being asked that question, but I'm, you know, I guess superstitious um, and have, uh, so when the ink is dry, then we will, then we will discuss. Love it. We, we would, we will look forward to that with um, much pleasure. I also love how you describe, Ayana, like this sense of really knowing someone. Like when you're in an archive, it feels like this particular sense of intimacy that you have um, with, with the person that um, you are now tending their papers in a way as a scholar or someone who's there. 
Well, to some degree, though, I have to sort of qualify what I said, because I might say that and I'm going to give myself permission also to be wrong or to be corrected. Right. And to expand my knowledge, the more that I read, like, you know, I haven't even lived long enough to to um, explore all that depth. But I also I know Shelley agrees with me. I don't appreciate when people go there. And they do this sort of colonial work where they say like, oh, I went to the archive and I was first and I'm asserting this, this and this because they're from out, you know, not anyway, I think that's very, very harmful. And so I don't want to be that type of person. But from what I know now and what I've the work I've been doing over the last dozen years, no one has ever been able to come to me and correct me and to say like something that I said in public was incorrect. But I. I think there's this intimacy that it forces you to look within and to really, it, it forces you to be kind of self-conscious in a way that you might not be when you're reading something that someone has carefully curated for you to look at. Her published works are carefully curated and with a particular intent or response to editors and such. But you know, her class notes when she's an undergraduate and she's supposed to be taking notes in you know, medical anthropology, but she's writing about AOR who's a character in the third book from the um, Geno Xenogenesis trilogy, like those are the things that really break open your consciousness. And so I encourage us all to, you know, read your former self and, and don't, don't try to be a, a, a one continuous autonomous person because that's not how her work is. She's multiple people in multiple moments, but any, don't trust anyone who ever says, I went here and I saw this and I'm asserting that because inevitably I've seen many things that have been wrong, you know, like categorically false. And I just, you know, keep it moving. <laughs> I love that. So archival work, not as conquest, but as relationship. Um, okay, okay, that's brilliant. I, I wanna ask you both. Ayana, you were just mentioning there have been just um, devastating rainstorms in California. Um, I'm thinking about climate. And I feel like these days in the media, the phrases climate justice or environmental justice are thrown around a lot. These are becoming popular phrases to attach to projects or grants or things that are um, being funded. And I'm curious as people who have spent such time reflecting on Parable of the Sower and Octavia Butler's work, if you feel like Butler's work gives us a more concrete or specific sense of what environmental justice looks like, is there something she helps us visualize or theorize um, beyond just these popular phrases? And Ayana, if you have thoughts, I would love to turn to you first. Well, I, I would like I would like Shelley's answer first, and then I will piggyback on that because I think. I think given that she's teaching a class with this in the name and what maybe some better ways of thinking about it would be, would, would serve us all well. Shelly, we'll toss it to you. Well, that's very kind of you to say, because I know you have a lot to say about this topic with the Seed to Tree exhibit you're co-curating at the New Children's Museum in downtown San Diego right now. So I hope you'll tell them a little bit about that. But I can say a few things. I do think it's a different vision of environmental justice. Butler said it was uh, in the hands of ordinary people where, you know, where he's most of the time it's not that in a lot of the texts that we see. She was also thinking it very concretely about not just climate narrowly, but climate in relation to other things. Like she talks about how prisons and our reluctance to build and repair schools and libraries is connected to what's going on with the environment. She says it's a much more complex problem than just an, an increase in temperature. So I'm really interested in a lot of different dimensions of her particular vision, but a few things would be, um, David Pello, the scholar, talks about critical and environmental justice as opposed to environmental justice. I know we have critical in front of a lot of terms now, and sometimes it's a little distracting, but here I think what he's trying to point to is solutions that don't center the state and state power as being things we look at when we're thinking about environmental justice. And I just believe that's very much Butler. You know, She's looking at ordinary people. What might they do? What are answers that aren't just about kind of aggrandizing state power and looking to the usual solutions to save us. 
And I believe that's incredibly important. I was thinking about how she's different from other things that get called to clarify her work. And I, I was looking at a passage in her journal that's just really stayed with me. She's thinking about climate change and environmental disaster. And she says, you know, I just can't bring myself to wish for the kind of disaster that might uh, move world actors to do something peaceably instead of a military solution. She says, I can't bring myself to wish for that because thousands of people like me would have to die for that to happen. And I was thinking about that, just reading a lot of Clify that does imagine existing institutions are going to save us, uh, whether it's, you know, the state or whether it's bankers, you know, and I think often that kind of Clify gets seen as more hopeful, but I actually feel that uh, Butler's more hard-headed, skeptical view of those solutions is the thing that actually makes it unique and incredibly prescient. There are other things too. I feel that she's ahead of her time in theorizing what uh, has been called by the scholar Rob Nixon, slow violence, where she talks about climate change not just being something that all at once or a big spectacular thing, but slow, boring, people may not even pay attention to it, like cancer clusters, right, arising over time. How do you deal with that? How do you even diagnose it? So there's that. And then I also really love in Parable of the Sower, the little moments of indigenous science. So there's the book that Lauren is reading. That It's her father's book and it's on indigenous plants. And there she's telling her friend, Joanne, this is the kind of thing that's gonna save us, that kind of knowledge. So I really like it that that comes into it too, because if you, I was started out as a 19th century scholar and you know, when uh, white colonizers were uh, denigrating native people in California, they would call them diggers because they thought they were just digging in the dirt and not riding on horses, but they were making flour out of acorns and had incredible protein. And, you know, I feel like this indigenous plants book, you know, kind of points to that briefly, which is also coming out of her research in some way. So I've said too many things. So again, I'd love to hear what Ayana would say. No, there's never, there's never too many things. I think one of the things that um, I love the idea of critical environmental justice because uh, I believe, I feel that that comes from those communities who, who are most impacted by climate disaster, um, who have to find solutions for survival um, and they can't wait for someone to come and tell them how to live after their homes have been wiped out because of poor government intervention, like the levees breaking or you know, or the coast washing away. It's it's an interesting juxtaposition to think about her work alongside folks like Mike Davis. Um, I think when you grow up on the coast um, and people think this is all, you know, like rainbows and beaches and Malibu, you don't realize like the, the land theft and other things that have happened or you know, the houses that are torn down to buy a park and then they name it after the person of color, which has happened here in my city. So, um, you know, I agree that, you know, climate justice is not just climate in the literal sense, but I believe Butler writes this sort of, sort of social science fiction. And if you ask questions about who in the society is most harmed by something and who needs the remedy the, you know, most quickly, when she's talking about people like me, uh, dying when something happens, she she realizes that it's not for her to sustain and exist in order for things to be better. It's not about her as an individual, but about the choices that uplift and, and care for the most vulnerable folks. And that's what you see in the Book of Martha. That's what you see in um, monophobic response. Um, and it you know, my heart is beating fast just thinking about how she kept trying to tell us over and over again that we need to look to our neighbors. We need to figure out who our allies are and how we can mutually help one another survive. It's really like an issue of like disability justice as well, or, you know, you know, it, it's definitely like expanding the sense of what the margins are um, from the margins, not from some centralized like top down notion. And that's what's truly radical about the folks, the young folks who are organizing now and really pushing back against the status quo. Thank you both. Um, I could ask you questions for two hours, but it's really important that we get some questions from our audience. People have been just waiting to speak with you. Um, so if you have a question, please feel free to submit it using the Q&A function 
at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And again, as Corey mentioned, please keep it concise as we're hoping to get through as many of these as we possibly can. Um, I'm going to begin with a question that came in early in um, our webinar today. And our question asker says, although the protagonist is a young adult, I never really thought of this book as young adult literature. I'd love to hear both of you respond to that. I'm curious um, what it's been like to work with young adults who are reading this book right now. I'm curious if you think it has um, some special valence or whether young adults are crucial to its staying power over time. Um, we're discussing this book decades after it was written. And I think it just recently hit the bestseller list within the last few years, um, which is unusual for a book to do that so um, far past, like post its publication date. So I'm curious, yeah, young adult literature, does that feel like a useful category to you when you think about Parable of the Sower or would you describe it otherwise? So, so first of all, young adult literature, um, is something that they use to sell books. So that's one thing, right? That's a that's a category to figure out where you put it on the shelf in the bookstore. So that's one thing that's sort of a false category. And also just like science fiction and black women writers, like young adult fiction is also marginalized. So for the person making the comment like, oh, I never thought of it as young adult fiction. Like, you know, I want people to always examine their own uh, assumptions because I read lots and lots of books, uh, again, because of the folks who are in my internal, my, in my house community, right? Be and none of the, none of the literature that I've read from middle grade to, you know, things for th third to fifth grade, like none of those things are subordinate to the literature that I'm teaching. And I often bring the so-called children's literature into my classroom. Um, and if you do have children, I would say if you want to teach them some things about getting along, speculative literature is the place to go. The um, uh, Zeta Elliott has some books called Dragons in a Bag that just finished the fifth. There's the Wild Seed Witches books. And then also my favorite series is, um, uh, it is uh, the Wings of Fire series that has like, like 17 books and it's written by Twee T. Sutherland. So I would say, we have to be careful when we when we try to silo things because so-called young adult literature is just it's all just literature and all honesty that maybe like doesn't have the f word in it you know i don't think that's you know we don't we don't need to to separate out good books but it definitely is a coming of age um and an autobiography but we're not categorizing it as that either right so just just to be aware I really like, uh, you know, Ayana's comments on uh, how there are adult readers of this as well. And I think that's something that's true of a lot of stuff that gets called YA recently, like Harry Potter. I can remember the most, my most brilliant colleague in the literature department, Lisa Lowe, was reading Harry Potter. Sorry about that. Yeah, I just realized I was muted. Didn't think that would happen. But yeah, I think that um, what Ayana is saying about uh, there are adult readers of so-called YA as well and not to silo things is important. But I think that's true with a lot of stuff that gets called YA in the last few years. Like I can remember when Harry Potter, you know, came out, although this was not within the last few years, but my most brilliant colleague like in the literature department was reading it at, th at the same time that my nine-year-old nephew was reading it. So I think, you know, there's a lot of of um, books like that that actually get a wider audience. Le Guin's uh, Earthsea Trilogy would be another great example of that. Uh, first novel published in 67. Some people call it the YA, the first YA novel. But yeah, I do think it's a marketing category. Coming of age was the phrase that was more important uh, for her. I do think there are a lot of aspects to its power that come from the fact that it's a coming of age story. So the alternative family, which is so powerful in a lot of YA, we see the construction of an alternative family as the kind of social unit in this novel. I think that's really important about it. I also think the intergenerational conflict is important to stage and that has a lot of resonance with my students. So Lauren loves her dad, right? But they disagree on a lot of things. And one of them is that her dad is a climate change denial denier. And she has a moment where she's talking to her friend, Joanne, where Joanne says, hey, your dad doesn't think we've changed the climate of the world. And she 
says, you know, he's a great guy, but he's not right about everything. So I feel like a lot of those aspects of the text are just so resonant today with the people who are usually like 18 to 26 in my classes that I'm teaching. Um, so, you know, even though we, you know, might talk about what is the category we want to use, I'm really interested in how Octavia was engaging specifically the idea of coming of age. And she thought I could write this about a middle aged person, but, you know, people aren't interested in middle-aged people. She said something like that in her journal, although she also will write about middle-aged people, of course. But I think here she really wanted to think about how a young person would come into conflict with a previous generation and have to try to create change with an alternative family. And that there are, those are a lot of classic themes that appeal to young people as well as older readers and can bring people together in an intergenerational conversation, which is one of the great things about this novel as well. Absolutely. Yeah, along the lines of intergenerational conflict or disagreement, we have a question here about um, the role of religion in Parable of the Sower. Um, in an age of declining religiosity or religious community participation, how have you seen students respond to Lauren's claim that human beings need religion? How do they respond to the character making her own religion? I would love to hear your experiences in your classroom or your sense of how students respond to Earthseed. Do you want to start, Diana? Yeah, I have a funny story about this question. One of my first times going back to my undergraduate university university as a, a lecturer, right? So I teach in the school where I got my undergraduate degree, right? One of my students said, um, like when we were discussing this book and I'm teaching it in person for one of the first times because I taught online for many years. She said like, this is what I said to my mom, like if God is everywhere, then what do I need to go to church, church for to be with God? Because I, you know, like if God is everywhere, then I can experience that kinship, you know, right here from the house. And so I thought that was funny. And that is a moment for many students who are like, like like Lauren, like uh, Octavia, when she was an adolescent, thinking about how her beliefs and existence were different from what her parents experienced. And I want to say, I don't think that Butler is saying that people need religion. I think it's way more complicated than that. Uh, that's one thing. And the other thing is that um, Butler says, and Olamina says she did not create Earthseed. And this is what Butler says about her own Uber of work, that she looked around and observed what was happening and then began to sort of articulate the themes that she, she witnessed and emerged and the patterns that she saw. So it's not this top-down approach, but it's a, a lateral non-hierarchical way of bringing different concepts in conversation with one another. Butler, her individual self, thought that her mother and grandmother and other Black folk who had experienced deprivation and, and you know, extreme violence in this timeline as Black women and Black folks, that they needed religion as an other place, as a third place to aspire to something and that that was helpful to them. Um, but Earthseed um, has space, right? A big project, something else to fixate on and instead of being anxious about whether one's individual soul was saved, but whether or not we would have a place to go and whether or not we could treat one another with the care because we're already among the stars. That's very, very different. I, I really reject when people are saying like, oh, you know, this is about religion because that's not what Butler is saying at all. She's very, very specific about it. Um, and if you ever get the opportunity to watch the Parable of the Sower opera, um, or hear Toshi Regan and or like Agent Marie Brown and other folks talk about, you know, murmuration and emergent strategy and things that you witness as they come up. It's not hierarchical. It's not like, oh, there's some God up here that needs to tell me how I should feel and how I should treat people and how I should dress and, you know, that I'm better than everyone else, that I'm, um, you know, the biggest and the smartest, but rather like, what do we observe around us? What can we believe in in one another? that what non-human entities, how can we treat the soil? What can we do, you know, how can the trees sustain us and we continue to feed the trees, right? So that's a whole different way of being than being like, oh yeah, religion is important. That, that's not the question, read it again. 
Yeah, the religion thing comes up a lot, um, you know, both with my friends and with my students, I would say. I've had some friends, older people, who are actually resistant to the book. And I, I agree with Ayana, in fact, that she wasn't saying religion is the answer, but was, you know, in her notebooks, we see it quite clearly. She says, what would bind people together in a time of crisis? What, what kind of beliefs might you know, allow people to come together. So kind of trying to think about it that way. She herself was not religious. In her notebooks, we see evidence of her like going off to church and being mad that the preachers being homophobic. Uh, she was very critical of the rise of the Christian right and politics at this time. We see that everywhere in the clippings and everywhere in the notebooks. So I also think she's reflecting on what she sees as hierarchical, problematic uh, religious beliefs that are entering politics and that are actually, you know, part of what's uh, making all of these cuts happen and education and censorship and libraries and whatnot. So, you know, you could write a whole book actually about that, going through Butler's archive and seeing all the ways she was really worried about how the Christian right was going to affect politics. So we could see her on the one hand, I think, um, thinking what will bind people together in a time of crisis. I think on the other hand, her version of religion is in dialectical relationship to the kind of hierarchical, authoritarian, anti-woman, anti-feminist kind of right-wing politics she was seeing come into ascendancy at that moment. So I think she's writing against that, even if she doesn't want to found a new religion or something, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a tricky topic. It's a kind of hard one to think about, but um, she was just so angry at the ways that she felt God and religion were used to beat people, keep them down, and, you know, create inequalities or uh, further deepen them. Thank you. We have questions for each of you individually. Um, someone would like Dr. Streeby to comment on the screensaver behind you and explain what is there. Sure. Let's see if I can look at it myself here. Uh, you know, when I was in the archive, there were, of course, a lot of different um, pieces that she put together, Butler, where she was thinking about um, you know, what am I going to do in this novel? What do I need to do? So she would make little cards like this one behind me, you know, often in multiple colors of ink, where she would try to kind of remember and reinforce what are the important things in uh, the draft that I'm writing for me to be focusing on. And so there you see some of the things that she uh, you know, is, is focusing on there in particular, which are really important topics, I think, obviously, like the increased risk of fire danger. You just see a few of the things uh, on the slide behind me. Uh, the brother Keith wanting manhood, again, wealth, power right now, yesterday. So she's thinking very much about gender there and, you know, how gender affects the ways that, you know, people confront change and different kind of inequalities. We see you know, information about sea level rise and bad storms that are coming right out of her research, the clippings from the LA Times. And um, you know, if you kept going, let's see if I can move the right way here. Uh, it's not just unemployment, but it's also um, privatization she's got down there at the bottom. So I think privatization and what was happening during the Reagan 80s was really very much on her mind when she was writing this. And, you know, uh, Ayana brought up Mike Davis's name when I was teaching this in 1992, or 1993 rather, uh, the parts of it that were about gated communities, the rise of walls, privatization were the parts that spoke to my students most powerfully. And we were also reading Mike Davis's Ecology of Fear. He passed away uh, in the last year and he's just a really important intellectual. So I, I kind of wanted to reiterate how important he was. He blurbed, uh, or he actually wrote a, a very, a uh, smart kind of analysis of Butler's text and how it emerged out of problems in her present that we could sort of see welling up with the LA uprisings. So um, yeah, there's just so much on this card. I've learned so much from, from looking at those materials. It's just a treat to see her handwriting. Um, we have a question for Dr. Jameson. Um, someone in the audience would love to hear about the Octavia E. Butler Legacy Network. Who is involved and who is impacted? What is the purpose and who is the audience? Oh, wow, that's a big question, but you can find those things on the interwebs. I will just say that it's an organization that I founded in 2011. Um, and the way that I came about doing that was realizing Butler's final resting place was here in Pasadena, or I'm not 
in, the, in Southern California, in Altadena, uh, where I grew up, um, and not in Seattle, Washington, where she passed away. And I thought like, wow, I bet other people would want to pay their respects. Um, at the time, there was this woman named Ayana Key, spelled just like my name, right, who ran this fan site, um, like OctaviaButler.net. So I really started social media stalking and looking at other people. Uh, I found out about Adrienne Marie Brown through um, uh, Kim Katrin Crosby, who was a like a blogger and said like, oh, Adrienne Marie Brown's my favorite blogger. And you know, so basically, it uh, there are people from all over the world who were involved in it in a collaborative way. Um, my one of my closest collaborators is Moya Bailey, who, of course, coined the term misogynoir, and she's a digital alchemist um, and she runs the Tumblr. So, there are many folks who have collaborated with us over the course of the last dozen years, including like Ruha Benjamin at Princeton University. We've done conferences, uh, and we, Shelly and I, will be doing a, a Shaping Change conference in 2016 at UCSD. Um, and um, it's really the folks who, who respect the non hierarchical way of working and help to leverage the the resources from larger institutions to be publicly available like those are the people who are impacted i mean it's a it's a huge it's interesting that the timelines are converging but i'm hoping to do more events around parable of the sower because it's such an important work um, and of course i work in a university so any students that i have you know always get to enjoy some of those things but that's a great question thank you for it but we will, we're still thinking about ways that people can be involved um, and be in community with one another that makes it also sustainable because it's self-funded and funded from community. Thank you. Thank you for that answer and for that work. Um, being that it's 2024, should we be educating ourselves and our neighbors for survival? Our audience member wants to know um, what you think Butler would say, but also what you would say. Shelly, do you want to take that one? Well, I can start. Um, you know, Butler said science fiction is one of our ways of looking ahead. So yeah, she, def she definitely thought we needed to be looking ahead. Uh, there's a little slide that I have from the archive where she imagines a child saying, they knew this was coming. Why didn't they do anything about it? And kind of plays that out. So she wrote this novel, I think very much wanting us to pay attention and to think about what we could do to shape change. Um, I think, you know, a lot of her tactics are micro and not macro, and I think she thinks things like journaling are important. I think she thinks seeds and knowing how to, you know, grow things in different situations is really important. Um, you know, I think if you read her novel, you could come up with like a 10-point plan probably of, you know, various things that she thinks are important to do. Uh, I think I'll let Ayana continue and see what she would add to that. Well, I would say that, again, we need to be careful about the way that we phrase things, because I would never presume to educate my neighbors. Um, but I do belong to this buy nothing group. And if someone needs something, whether it's immediate or if someone is passing something along, um, there used to be a community garden in walking distance from here where we reclaimed this dead land that had been neglected in a public school, uh, middle school. So I, I'm not going to say that I think that it's my job to um, educate my neighbors because that's presumptuous. But I will say that I can learn from other people and that I can, uh, you, you know, like when someone needed a sewing machine, I left it on my front porch and someone borrowed it for a few weeks and otherwise it's in storage. So we have to think about ways that we're not filling the landfills, you know, because throw it away where? The world is round, right? There's no such thing as away. And that's one of the things that Butler writes. So I think if we just keep that in mind, that uh, we can balance out our need to do something about the problem, but realize individual actions are very important, but we cannot blame people for, so for problems that have been created by capitalism and corporate greed. Um, like it doesn't matter how many plastic straws get used in my four person household, if we're still, you know, dumping you know, we're still bur burying things in landfills and polluting the air. You know, people are still getting cancers by the largest ports in the state in Los Angeles 
um, and Long Beach, right? Like we, we have to balance out the awareness of, you know, judging people for what they do and do not do um, because some poor folks cannot be worrying about those things. They need to worry about survival and feeding their kids. None of us is better than the other people just because we can conspicuously consume driving around in a Tesla or whatever. Like it's all of us are complicit in benefiting from the global systems that oppress people and all of us have a part to play in recognizing our problematic our problematic things that we do right we're here like using these machines and the internet etc like we all have to 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 realize that it's all of us we we all need to survive together that's the only way oh that's that's amazing yep we all need to survive together that's so butler um Okay, sadly, this is the final question we have time for this afternoon. Um, one of our guests would like to know if you could comment on ways that you see Octavia Butler's own life experiences as a Black, queer, neurodivergent woman show up in her work. I'm just I, gonna, I, yes, please. Yeah, I'm just going to say up front, she did not identify as queer and she did write about that. So I don't want to out anyone or miscategorize anyone, although her characters and her writing are very queer and she was inclusive of everyone. I think we should be very careful about um, assigning things like that. She was definitely masculine of center and she was treated a particular way because of that, including harassed by police, but we have to be careful when we're claiming people for our communities because we don't wanna also cause inadvertent harm. But all of her work, you know, really puts, the margin at the center and lived experience and embodied experience at the center in whatever variations that exist within, you know, within the natural environment and within ourselves. And I think that's vital and important. Um, and so I just want to say that she said that what you bring to it is very important, but also that sometimes the things that you bring to it are more about you and less about what's there and to just be aware of that. She did not like when people projected onto her work. She, she even said, you know, like, don't psychoanalyze me, like, leave me alone, you know, in interviews and things like that. So I, I think she definitely wrote our, made space for all of us to exist um, and really divide defied categorization and simple binaries of, of all kinds. And I think that's what's in her work. I agree with that. I just want to speak to the uh, neurodivergence part. I think Dr. Sammy Schock's work, uh, Body Minds Reimagined, is really great on Octavia Butler's work and how she like is able to kind of uh, critically think about like lots of cr dis critical disability studies uh, concepts and really important ways and the hyper empathy that we were thinking about at the beginning of this program you know if you're hyper if you're a hyper empath you are more vulnerable but you also uh feel uh any pain that you're dealing out to others and she was very interested in that as a question and a problem but i just wanted to shout out dr sammy shot because i think she does really good work on this if you're interested in those kinds of questions that would be the place i would go mm -hmm. Yes, and Dr. Shada Kafai's Crip Kinship really goes far from being written from a disabled perspective and in community with other disabled folks as opposed to just being an academic. So those are some great places to look. And Dr. Kafai is my work neighbor and, you know, um, so her work is really vital. Beautiful. Well, Ayana and Shelley, your work is very vital too. And I want to thank you on behalf of everyone here for sharing your knowledge, your insights, and your ideas with us this afternoon. Um, it's been such a pleasure to spend this time with you and think about Octavia Butler. This concludes our program today. I want to thank our audience for the very thoughtful questions that you brought to our um, moments together. Today's program has been recorded and will be posted on the Radcliffe website in about a week. For information on upcoming Radcliffe programs and to see videos of our past events, please visit radcliffe.harvard.edu. We particularly hope you will join us for our next virtual program in this series on young adult literature and climate change 
featuring author Nede Okorafor on Tuesday, February 20th at 4 p.m. Thank you again for joining us today and take care.